The story you are about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts featuring historical characters, events, or places that has played a role in shaping history. Please sit back and listen as I recite this narrative for you. Delfina and Maria de Jesus Gonzalez. Human trafficking remains a major issue in the world today. The innocent are preyed upon and exploited, and once they are used up and no longer serve their purpose, the victims are cast aside in one way or another. Back in the 50s, a pair of sisters, Delfina and Maria de Jesus Gonzalez, undertook in one of the more infamous cases of this crime. Sisters Delfina, Maria de Jesus, Maria Luisa and Carmen were all born into an extremely poor family in El Salto de Guanacatlan, Jalisco. Their father was an authoritative and abusive beast who was also a member of the rural police. His job was to ride through town and make sure it was all okay. He liked to abuse his power and during an argument, he once shot and killed a man. He was a father who ruled with an iron fist and didn't think twice about abusing his children if they failed to follow the code of conduct he created for them. If they did anything he didn't approve of, such as wear makeup, he would lock them in the jail to teach them a lesson. Over time, the Gonzalez's father became known for abusing his power, which led to him shooting innocent people and generally holding himself above the law. This garnered him a number of people who wanted revenge, and soon the girls and the rest of their family had to move from their home in order to avoid any sort of vigilante-style justice. They moved to San Francisco del Rincon, otherwise known as San Pancho. The sisters grew up fearful of poverty, so as they became young adults, they opened up a few businesses. They opened a bar, which gave them some stability but not enough for their taste. This led them to deciding to create a prostitution ring. They started by using their own bodies as a form of currency, bribing the local police with sex in order to convince them to look the other way as the sisters began using the bar as a brothel. Before long, they had opened up a string of brothels in San Francisco del Rincón, Leon, Porresima del Rincón, San Juan de los Lagos, El Salto, San Juan del Rio, and Jalisco. Sisters Delfina, Maria de Jesus, and Carmen operated the brothels in Jalisco and Guanajuato, while Maria Luisa ran the brothel near the border of Mexico. Between them, they also bought a bar in Lagos, Jalisco, and through the previous owner, they inherited the nickname Las Poquianchis, which they despised. Pretty young girls were sought out throughout the countryside, and they would be told they could provide them with jobs such as being maids or waitresses. The young girls, dreaming of a better life in the bigger cities, would eagerly accept, not knowing what they were really getting into. The Gonzaleses also used personal ads to lure in wait staff, promising room and board along with a well-paying job, only to turn around and hold the would-be employees as sex slaves. Other girls were straight up kidnapped by special mercenaries who were paid to take the women to the Gonzalez's place. Once these gals entered the brothel, they were held as prisoners, some never even able to go outside. Virgins who were brought in were set aside for special customers who paid higher rates to deflower the girls. None of the women ever saw a dime for their dreadful duties. Business boomed and the ring of whorehouse spread to Mexico City and several other areas. The only setback came when biology got in the way and the girls started to become pregnant. These led to forcible back alley style abortions with the babies being buried on the property. Eventually, when the sex slaves grew ill, suffered from an STD or just stopped being willing to perform, 
they too were murdered and buried on land surrounding the brothels. The killings were not done in a humane way either, as women were intentionally starved to death by being placed in locked rooms. Others were bludgeoned with lugs. Even some customers never found their way out of the whorehouse if they happened to show off too much money. In those cases, the men were killed, then robbed and buried. By the time the truth came out, there would be an estimated 91 or more skeletons in the ground, some of which belonged to the unborn fetuses of the girls who got pregnant. This cycle continued for nearly a decade before one of the prostitutes at Loma del Angel managed to escape in January 1964 and fled to the police. Fortunately, the officers she talked to were not the corrupt man on the payroll of the sisters. A search warrant was obtained and the sisters were arrested on January 14, 1964 during a raid at the Loma del Angel Ranch. Prostitution was legal in Mexico, but all the extreme happenings she described led to an investigation. The sisters, all dressed in mourning black for their brother, were paraded through the ranch while people outside called for them to be lynched. A dozen women were found at the ranch in an emaciated and filthy state, and they didn't hesitate to point out areas on the ground to police where bodies were buried. The decomposed bodies and skeletal remains of at least 91 men, women, and fetuses were found buried in mass graves. Because the public were adamant the sisters needed to be hanged, they were sent to another jail further away. Sister Maria Luisa turned herself in a week later, terrified the people were going to lynch her, and thought she would at least be protected in jail. She was subsequently arrested. At their trial, the sisters admitted to forcing the women into bestiality and other kinks. The trial was described as chaotic, with insults being shouted back and forth across the courtroom. The Gonzaleses also confessed to holding satanic rituals on the grounds. Details of the sisters forcing the prostitutes working for them to engage in sexual acts with animals, torture of other girls and clients, and killing when instructed, enraged and disgusted those in the room. They were also charged with corruption for bribing the authorities. They were ultimately given long prison sentences. The three sisters were each sentenced to serve 40 years in prison. One of the sisters died in 1984 while in prison. The people in charge left her remains to fester in the heat for a full day, allowing the rats to eat off her corpse. The other sister was released in the mid-90s after serving around 30 years. She vanished into the county side soon after. Delfina and Maria's other sisters also served time. One died in jail from cancer and the other went crazy from the pressure of the situation and had to be placed in special care. Giulia Tufana was an Italian professional poisoner. She was famous for selling poison to women who wanted to murder their abusive husbands. She was the inventor of the famous poison Aqua Tufana, which is named after her. She's the most successful serial killer whose name you've never heard. Her story isn't well known like other female serial killers because her family was not well known and there were no family portraits. Giulia Tufana killed hundreds of men in 17th century Italy when she turned her makeup business into a poison factory, selling a deadly concoction called Aqua Tufana thought to have been laced with arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Tufana made it her mission and her business to help aspiring widows murder their husbands. During the Renaissance, in an era of arranged marriages that left no possibility of divorce, the only way out of an unhappy union was death. Women in Italy had only three options at their disposal. If they didn't want to enter the convent, and they are, to get married, to stay single and rely on sex work to survive, or to become a respected and well-off widow, which means you still have to be married. So more often than not, 
they were often forced into marriage by their families. Once married, husbands had complete control over their wives, and women were often completely powerless. Husbands could beat their wives without facing any punishment or subject them to all kinds of cruel treatments. For many women, the third option was the most attractive. Luckily for them, 17th century Rome had a flourishing criminal magical underworld that provided the services to make this possible. This underground community was found in other large European cities and was made up of alchemists, apothecaries, and experts in black magic. In reality, these experts didn't so much as dabble in the dark arts as they did solve problems that doctors or priests of the time could or would not, like provide abortions. No wonder some women wanted to be widows. Aqua Tofana provided a quick, discreet solution. The information about her background is sparse. She was born in 1620 in Palermo and was possibly the daughter of Tofania di Adamo, who was executed in Palermo on July 12, 1633, accused of having murdered her husband Francis. Tofana was described as beautiful, and she spent a lot of time with apothecaries, was present when they made their potions, and eventually developed her own poison, Aqua Tofana. It is, however, also possible that it was her mother, Tofania de Adamo, who made the poison and passed the recipe on to her daughter. She began to sell this poison to women who wanted to escape abusive husbands. Her daughter, Geraloma Espera, was also active in this. She eventually moved her business to Naples and Rome, following in her mother's footsteps and maybe even using her recipe. Tofana allegedly began selling a lethal concoction of her own. Julia was sympathetic to the low status of women and most often sold her poison to women trapped in unhealthy and dangerous marriages. She became known as a friend to the troubled wife and received many referrals. With the help of her daughter and a group of reliable women, Tofana gained a reputation as a friend to troubled women. Her group of poisoners may have also recruited a local Roman priest. Father Gerolamo to secretly take part in their criminal network. But again, information is spotty on Tufana's actual business. It is generally believed that Gerolamo supplied the arsenic for the poison and Tufana and her colleagues disguised it as a cosmetic for their customers. If anyone were to ask about Tufana's booming business, all she had to do was show them her bottles of Aqua Tufana, a covetable face cream or oil for women looking to be single again. Julia Tufana packaged her poison so that it could easily blend in on a woman's vanity beside her makeup, lotions, and perfumes. Although it was known to her customers as Aqua Tufana, the glass bottle itself was labeled Mana of St. Nicholas of Bari, which was actually a popular healing oil at that time for blemishes. Despite its subtlety, Aqua Tufana was powerfully lethal. The colorless and tasteless concoction could kill a man with just four to six drops. But the real genius behind the poison was how undetectable it was even after death. It would kill a victim over days, mimicking a disease. Administered through some kind of liquid, the first doses induced weakness and exhaustion. The second dose caused symptoms such as stomach aches, extreme thirst, vomiting, and dysentery. The gradual decline, however, would give the victim the chance to get his affairs in order, which usually meant ensuring that his soon-to-be widow would be well taken care of after his death. Finally, with a third or fourth dose administered over the next several days, the man would meet his fate. In the 1650s, one of Julia Tufana's clients got cold feet. She'd bought the Aqua Tufana from Julia and taken it home. She'd even gone as far as to put the poison in her husband's soup. But suddenly, she had been gripped with regret. She stopped her husband from eating the soup, and the suspicious man forced her to tell the truth. Then, he turned her over to the papal authorities in Rome. She finally confessed and pointed the finger at Julia as the miscreant who had sold her the poison. Julia was warned of her impending arrest, and she fled to a church asking for sanctuary. It was granted. But when a rumor spread through Rome that Julia had poisoned the water, the church was stormed and Julia was handed over to papal authorities, who after brutal torture, confessed to killing as many as 600 men with the use and sale of her poison. 
between the years of 1633 and 1651 alone, making her the mastermind behind one of the most notorious murder plots in history. It's possible that the real number was even higher. In July of 1659, Julia Tufana was executed along with her daughter and three employees. They were killed in Rome's Campo de Fierro, a popular location for execution. Additionally, over 40 of Tufana's lower class customers were also executed while women of the upper class were either imprisoned or escaped punishment altogether by insisting that they never knew their cosmetics were actually poisoned. Aqua Tufana became so famous that in 1791, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart claimed he was being poisoned with Tufana's invention. The composer was still working on his Requiem Mass when he fell seriously ill. From his deathbed, Mozart declared, I feel definitely that I will not last much longer. I am sure that I have been poisoned. He went on to claim, someone has given me Aqua Tufana and calculated the precise time of my death. While poisoning most likely didn't kill Mozart, the fact that Julia Tofana's recipe was still being discussed more than 100 years after her death is clear evidence that her poison was very popular. Hey everyone, I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took the time to listen to my narration. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I am Twisted Mind and please enjoy the rest of your day. Salamat!